Williams. I think in our record here. Or, or am I doing it wrong? It's recording. Ah, okay, it's recording. Good. So then I will maximize this. And and again, uh, we start with a small uh, did this small activity, and I have seen the, the papers here. Ah, oh, great. Um, so uh, basically, now I'm interested in the most what is, in your opinion most important result or implication and phenomenon that is related to entropy. And I hope that after we finish this talk, we can then have a look at the post-its and see what's been written there. Maybe uh, also uh, somebody has the date to rewrite it. Can be another work out. Uh, yeah, so, so what is, in your opinion, the, the most important result? So it doesn't have to be like result that, that contains entropy as a formula or something, but something that is in more general related to the, this entropic phenomenon. So basically it can be like something in thermodynamics that is, that is given by entropy or like influenced by entropy or like in application, I don't know. Condensed matter, not that not to be physics, can be biology. Want to like bias you too much? So. And and when you have it, just just come here and it somewhere so like only a little bit of space. It doesn't matter. Good patient is patient term. Mm -hmm. Our old time on university relations. Mm -hmm. Same as our old time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Second part of the that makes this part. It's used in compression of data. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, it would be uh, it's used as an arrow. Arrow time. Hmm. The universality. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Possible implication to biological systems. Like, uh, for example, the molecular motors. Yeah, mm -hmm. Somebody else? Well, contribute to the Gibbs paradox. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, somebody else is writing? No. Uh, yeah, so I think that most of the people voted for uh, Arrow of Time. I was actually had in mind uh, another application that you also had, the spin glasses, which is because it was the last uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, after a long time for statistical physics and or complex systems. Uh, and also because I'm now a little bit working on the various applications in this, in, in social systems. But the arrow of time, I think it's quite nice. We might, I might have uh, like little voting. Let's, I will put a little voting on the, on my Twitter account where I have shared all my talks. So you might have seen it. And you will see what the Twitter thinks is the most important. I will choose these ones. But the arrow of time is also one of the very important 
very important uh, applications. And now, um, in the, la the last talk, I would like to go a little bit more, be a little bit more theoretical. So, uh, it's the opposite approach from lecture two, where we basically didn't think much about the properties of the entropy and took a system and tried to calculate the entropy. Now, I would take probably the approach that you that uh, you were you saw in the lecture on uh, information theory that. Uh, Shun basically defined a set of axioms and A defined the entropy. Now I would like to uh, discuss uh, how these uh, axioms can be built, how what, what are their relation, and what uh, we can learn from like having axiomatic approach to entropy. And also I will discuss different motivations for introducing axiomatic uh, uh, schemes and their possible connection. And um, I'm glad that uh, you've already done this uh, before. So I start with the repetition of the Shannon Kinch axioms. And they are basically um, activated by the information theory. You've seen it before. I, I don't know if I uh, wrote them in exactly the same form as in your information theory uh, lectures. So I just go through them very quickly. So uh, in this formulation, I say that uh, I define the entropy such that it's continuous uh, of the probability distribution only, which means that it depends only on the distribution and not on any other parameters. Uh, it's maximal for the uniform distribution. It's uh, so-called expandable, which means that event with zero probability does not change the entropy. So basically, this. Ah, I have to talk to the microphone. Okay, this side. Okay, this is a bit tricky because then I have to put the button there. No, no, I will be doing that. I don't have too many slides, so I can go back and forth three times. Uh, so uh, yeah, so basically, if I add, if I have an events and I at one event with zero probability, the entropy doesn't change. Sounds reasonable. And then there is this most interesting axiom that is called additivity. So basically, I say that the entropy of the joint uh, distribution is the, entropy, is the sum of these entropies, where if these two uh, events are not independent, and the second entropy is conditional entropy, which is written in this form. These four axioms, um, as you've seen, and uh, you also can find uh, the proof uh, in many places. Um, these four axioms determine entropy up to maybe a multiplicative constant, which is not really here, uh, or here maybe only the multiplicative constant. So this sets the units uh, in which we measure. Okay, some echo. I have a muted. You have muted it. So this mute this one. So now, now it should be okay. No, it's recording there. Very well. So it's recording there. Ah, I see. So I go there. So do you hear me now better? Okay, sorry for that. Um, good. So, and now um, basically what many people tried to do is that since the first three axioms um, first sound very natural and there is like very hard to think about how they changed it people start thinking about how to generalize the fourth axiom. And in this case, you can um, have many uh, possibilities. So one possibility is to generalize additivity. So it's uh, the case of Tsaris entropy we've seen before. So basically you uh, make a deformation or a variant of additivity rule. So here I have the Q sum, which is the uh, X plus Y plus one minus Q times the product of these two. And it's called Q addition. And then uh, I need to uh, introduce this conditional entropy. And here the QI 
Uh, row IQ is so-called S-core distribution, which naturally appears in uh, these uh, cases. So basically, because there is this Q, so there must be appearing the PQ, but we have to normalize because PQ is, doesn't sum up to one. We have to normalize it again. And if you go, you can go through the proof and then show that this uniquely determines solid entropy again up to a multiplicative constant. This can be found, this was first done by, by Sumiyoshi Abe. Uh, and you don't see the bottom line. Sumiyoshi Abe in. If you open the chat and close it, it will go away. Oh, I Move the mouse away, it should go away after a second or so. Okay. So I usually did. Yes. Ah, yeah. Great. Great, great, great. Um, it was done in, in 2000. Then, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, how does your identity generalize identity and so, so, so basically, you say, um, so it's additivity, you say that the, the entropy of the joint event is not sum of these entropies, but it is Q sum of these entropies, sorry, being uh, not explicit. So basically this is the replacement of the, the fourth axiom with this. Or, yeah, you will make it. Uh, sorry, I would ask about that symbol. Yes. Uh, is that the right uh, sum? No, it's the... I know it's just brand new symbol. It's it's it's, it's a new symbol. People uh, kind of lack of this symbol, so they use this direct sum and direct product, tensor product yeah. with this Q to to denote this deformation. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't have to have anything with that. It's just because we don't have enough symbols that, on one hand, like somehow are close to the regular plus and, and times, and then on the other hand have this parameter. So that's, that's the reason. So probably it would be better to write it as a, a function of two, basically two, two value function or something like that. Um, good. So the other uh, option was to um, determine uh, different averaging in the original Shannon Kinchin axioms. Basically, you say that the conditional entropy, so the conditional entropy is defined as the regular arithmetic mean. So it's the probability distribution times the conditional entropy given particular event in the other, uh, in the other uh, set. Um, here, one can define uh, alternative averaging, which is called kolmogorov nagmo average. This is kind of useful in many situations. You can think about it. Um, if I have a simple example, I have a square of size A, square of size B. I make a, a square with the same, so that S1 and S2 is the S, so basically that the total um, the total area is the same, this is some of the two areas I would ask what is the C. So, you know, so this is the, so the C is square root of A squared plus B squared. This is the, this generalized average, this in this case is P average. Uh, you might know harmonic average, you might know ge geometric average. So it, all of these averages can be written in this form. Uh, and we this then say that that we have the, the basically the, the the entropy of the joint event is the regular sum, but the conditional entropy has this weird form uh, of um, kolmogorov nagmo average. And then you can show again. I will not be doing it here. That the only choice is this this um, exponential function e to the one minus q x minus one. Uh, over one minus Q, 
and basically then uh, you end up with Rennie entropy. So this is something we have seen a little bit before that this is the Rennie entropy. So you can uh, find these uh, or define these axioms such that they lead to Rennie entropy. And this has been done in this paper in 2004. And um, you can play with this generalized additivity rule uh, as you wish in, in a paper by Belia. Uh, this is one of the possibilities. So they were doing this thing that here the plus here is, is basically a most general, let's say operator that you can think of. And then this, this G is again, the this, this common growth Nakamura average, and then basically you plug everything in that do the proof. And then you can find that basically the most general class of uh, functions that uh, satisfies these axioms is the function of Rennie entropy or size entropy because they are a function of each other. So basically it means that um, any increasing function of size entropy is the most general class that satisfies these axioms. And this has been uh, shown a um, few times uh, um, like by independently by few scientists. So um, here I mention uh, another work by Pierre Giulio Tempesta from Spain who um, has this approach that he says uh, the entropy of the joint system must be for independent systems. Uh, this function, this phi of this two. So now it's this better notation that it's not the, the plus, but it's really the general function. And then you say this phi uh, must have some group properties. So like symmetry, associativity, no composability. And what he did is that he used the group theory and then he was able to show more or less the same thing so that um, uh, the, the G can be written in some general form and that, that then this entropy is written in terms of uh, this PI times generalized log of uh, PI where this generalized log is basically this PI to alpha. And of course, he was considering special class of entropies where you don't, where you have so-called so trace class. So it's some of the GPI. Uh, of course, if you take any function of this, then it's again, um, you just change the, the uh, way this, this uh, of this phi, but it will still remain uh, just the same type of function. Ah, thank you. Served in a cup. Unusual. <laughs> uh, so maybe one can mix it with the coffee. Um, now I want to talk about, uh, let's say, so we have seen that, that there, are, there are many possibilities how to generalize these, these Shannon Kinchin axioms. What we were interested in a few years ago was whether there is some classification of these, uh, let's say, um, rules that, that are various or whether we can maybe try to see um, what entropy is good for which system because these axiomatic approaches are maybe nice because uh, they, they really allow you to derive many entropies, but it's not a priori clear whether they are useful for any practical system, right? So uh, we were interested in whether uh, we can maybe try to classify this system of entropies a bit. Uh, and to this end, we were interested in how the multiplicity and entropy uh, scales with that system and connected with this with the Sharon Kinchin axioms. And for this, we use uh, theory of scaling. I don't want to go too many details, but it's like uh, when you do a critical phenomena, then what you do is that you rescale the system or like distance of the system. So in this case, we rescale the size of the system. So from n particles, we need to clump the n particles. And then if you do, and then you can show by a mathematical theorem that if you do it for large n, uh, then the ratio of the multiplicity 
pose like uh, lambda to some constant. So this is a mathematical term that is not uh, so difficult to prove. And then you have this exponent. So basically the leading term is always n to c0. And uh, then you can do the second scaling, which is that it's not you risk the n to lambda n, but also n to n to lambda. So you have this power rate scaling, and then you can do the same with which is the like the correction to the first term, and then you get, have this first correction, which is n to c zero log n to c one, etc. So uh, you see the pattern uh, here. Um, what we were yes yes yes. Um, yeah, can, can you repeat what was n because I mean, n is the size of the system. Okay, okay, but that can change a lot from system to system. The meaning no, yeah. So we are now interested in like kind of thermodynamic limits. So, so exactly. So this will be these exponents will be describing the properties of the system. So for each system, we can can get this characteristic scaling exponents mm -hmm. that will determine. Uh, the how the system behaves if it's very large like uh, renormalization exactly exactly that's that's the that's the idea uh so and here here, here what typically in renormalization or critical phenomena you do you only are interested in this first exponent uh we are we want to go like a little bit further because it might be also interesting uh and you will see that it is indeed interesting what's this CD? Uh, yeah, sorry. So this was taken for um, for another CD entropies, class entropies, uh, that was introduced by my colleagues uh, Rudy Hanel and Stefan Turner, and it's basically the first step in um, doing this classification. So I will show you that it, that these are included in this this general um, in in this general scheme. So so it is this class of entropies that. On, that are like restricted for this first two scaling exponents. So we would call it C0, uh, C1, but in their paper, they use the CD and then some other pa papers citing them refer them as the CD entropy. So it's like already the name that that, that lives its own life. Yeah, I can just uh, add the comment, maybe uh, the relationships between this relation to Karamata assumption. Mm -hmm. It uh, could be very. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, these ideas appear here and there in, in like condensed theory, critical phenomena. So, this is something that people are interested in in general of how your system behaves when you, when you rescale it, right? When you change the size. This is natural. It's interesting to mention because uh, I don't know uh, what is the year of the result in Stefan and Rudy. Did you write this? Uh, Classification paper was from what year? The first one would be, say, 2010, 12. I would need to. And then in the, this their paper, they derived these relationships, which were already known in Karamata's theory. And I don't know, Jan, when, uh, when is uh, the Karamata theory starting? This uh, form of. Uh, when? 30s? 30s. So it was uh, the result of 30s, they discover, rediscovered by like, yeah, uh, kind of the years uh, after that. I mean, in a way, yes, but of course, the thing is that the hero really applied to the end, so the multiplicity and then find the entropy and then do the like, uh, they provided the examples of the the, the four different uh, also exponents, which I'll also show later. But you have real examples, so it's not just you know just a mental exercise that, that really different exponents describe different systems that have something with the real physics systems. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, W is number of microstates. Yeah, it's a multiplicity as, okay. as, as we all, as always in this sort of talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 here I I I before I was using this n one n two here I just you know the number of part, the total number of particles, and, and consider that the structure is the same. Uh, and so, as I say, this is not new. So basically, you can define this set of uh, n free scaling, which is that basically you take the n fold exponential times lambda times n fold uh, logarithm, and you see that the zero of uh, rescaling is the lambda x. The first is the 
uh, x to lambda, the second is the e to log to the lambda, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they have some nice group properties and everything. And um, then you can repeat the procedure. And then you see the structure that what you basically get is that you have the uh, that the exponents are like n to c0, log n to c1, double log to c2. Etc. And if you want to, you can go as far as you want if you wish. Of course, normally you take the, only the first few exponents because these are the ones that are important. Uh, but what can happen is that, um, so yeah, so we can like uh, derive this fancy formulas. Uh, what can happen is that the c0 is infinity because this is, this is not forbidden. Uh, that means that, the, that uh, Wn grows faster than any polynomial. So it means that it grows exponentially. So basically what we can do is that we replace the, the W by log W and then do the same thing. And if it's not enough, we replace it by double log, et cetera. So basically then the, the most general expansion of this type is that you take the elf exponential of this and c to c0, log n to c1, log log n to c2, etc. With this, we found that this is the, if you, in any kind of rescaling theory, this is the most general rescaling that you can think of. But I'm sorry, I'm, I'm lost. Like, how, how do you do the rescaling? I, I don't get the idea, sorry. So, so basically, we define this general, so we, we generalize these two, this two simple rescaling, so like this multiplicative x to lambda and x lambda times x and x to lambda. So these are the, the second line. So basically, this is what we were considering at the beginning. So the, the rescaling was that from x to lambda x or from n to lambda n, or the second was from n to n to lambda. And okay. this is actually just the first two uh, cases of other types of rescaling that you can uh, denote with n. Actually, if you plug in the minus one to this, it's giving you the additive rescaling. So the r minus one x is x plus lambda. And you can also go the negative ones if you want. Okay. Um, so that's why uh, we use this, this formalism and again, uh, um, yeah, so you can derive very general formulas, but basically the most important is this last uh, last line where we have this, uh, that the Wn can be approximate for large n, like as the L times exponential, uh, like n L fourth exponential n to C0, block n to C1, et cetera. And you can do the same with the entropy, actually. Uh, so um, you basically write the scaling entropy as the, the in terms of W, and then you uh, say let's consider that entropy depends on W. And what I what I have is that that I have the same expansion. And then uh, I've been discussing that that the the n of W n if we want to have it extensive, should go linearly with n. And from this, you can determine the relation between the coefficients c and d, where the c are the coefficients for the, um, for the multiplicity and d are the coefficients for the entropy. And again, without going to the, to the details, you can derive the relation between them. So once you know the, the scaling coefficients of your sample space or your multiplicity, then you know your coefficients of your of the extensive entropy. Uh, and to give you some examples, we can think about uh, several processes. So maybe start with a random walk. So random walk is like really n times to single coin, whether you go to the left or to the right, then the uh, number of possible states is two to n. So then you see that basically the, the you can calculate that the D one is one. And what we get is that um, in this case, is really the Boltzmann entropy that um, is the most useful because it's extensive. So when I was talking uh, at, at the beginning that while log of W is the entropy, and I said, because log is uh, easy to, um, that it makes the product the sum, 
just one uh, easy argument, but the other is that this is uh, then uh, the extensive entropy for exponential systems. So exponentially growing systems, this is the most simple case of system and uh, ubiquitous in nature. Uh, this the log W is extensive. You can think about uh, another example where you have so-called aging random walk. So then you have a walk where you will throw a coin, do one step in some direction, then you throw a coin again, and you have to do two steps in the same direction. Then you throw a coin and you have to do three steps in the same direction, and then four and five and etc. And if you then um, do the calculation, then you see that the state base grows approximately like two to square root of n. So it's like two to n half. And then by the calculation, the scaling exponent is two. And then the extensive entropy is the log w squared. Uh, so then for the magnetic coins, uh, what is, uh, I call it magnetic coins, this is the structure forming systems from the previous talks. You can find that the sample space goes super exponential. So it goes like n to, uh, n to n or like e to n log n. For this, the scaling exponents are one and minus one. And here the entropy would be log w over log log w. Here, uh, I have to mention that we didn't use this entropy. And the reason for that is that it doesn't uh, fulfill the shannon kinchin axiom 2 because uh, the shannon kinchin axiom 2 tells you that the entropy is maximized for the uniform distribution or in other ways it must be symmetric in all the in all the uh, distributions of probability uh, of the elements but this is not the case for structure forming systems because first it's not, uh, it's not maximized by uniform distribution and second it's not symmetric because the probability of finding a particle in a free state and finding a particle in like molecule are, are not interchangeable. These states are basically uh, fundamentally different. So this is an example of a system where the second canonic axiom doesn't hold and it's natural because it's not just relabeling, relabeling the colors of the balls or something. It's really uh, changing the physical state. So that's the reason why, uh, in this case, we still use the, the log w because the log w is extensive if we uh, do not use this, um, this approach that, or this, this assumption that the entropy must be uh, maximized by the uniform distribution. Otherwise, we would need to use this entropy. Then what you can think of is the random network. So basically, I have n nodes. And then I say each, li each link between the nodes is my state. So basically I have, can have the weight of each link or something like that. And then of course the number of links goes like to the binomial factor n over two. And so then we get that the number of uh, states grows like n to two to n squared. So then basically this d is one half. And then it means that uh, the, uh, the uh, extensive entropy is log w to one half. Then we can think about another model where we have the run, so-called random walk cascade, which means that to the normal left and right, I add the third possibility to split. So it's like, I don't know, uh, like a deep decay of atoms or something like that. Basically, I split the worker to two independent workers they then do independent steps. They can also be in the same position for simplicity. And then basically you can find that the number of possible configurations is two to two to n. Uh, so then basically the first two exponents are zero. And the third one is, is one because the, it grows like so this double exponentially. And then you have to use this double log. Uh, and so then what you can do is that you can relate this to, to this C, to this other shannon pinching axiom. So if you say, I want that the axioms uh, one, two, three are valid, uh, then it gives you some constraints to the, to the uh, scaling exponent. So basically here it would, so for negative C, we violate the uh, shannon pinching axiom three and here, for this bigger than one, 
uh, we evaluate the uh, uh, Schoenner Kinchin axiom too, and then we see that there are a few uh, uh, other cases where you get this different, and now I refer to it CD entropies because originally the C0 and C1 were denoted as CD. So that's why uh, uh, I call it here CD entropy and, and it remained in the literature. So that's why I uh, still uh, have it. And you see, I think this is the first paper you were asking, whether uh, it's 2011. Uh, and then you can generalize. So this was done for two, first two exponents. You can do it for uh, more than one exponent. So then basically you get that in this uh, D0, D1, D2, have this random walk cascade where, um, so you, you have this space where you have all the processes we've been discussing. The cumulative entropy is somewhere in between. Uh, and you can, you can have a look. And then uh, again, uh, you have this space. Good. Uh, so maybe are there some questions to this? So then what you basically have is a, not like classification of particle entropies, but plus like classes of entropies that scale the same. So for each entropic function, you can always calculate, depending on like really the particular function, you can calculate the scaling exponents. And if they belong to the same class, then there are differences only in the like finite size effects. So you have many, then you can have many entropies that fall into the same class, but the asymptotic properties are the same. So it's, yeah. There are potentially uh, many, many classes that are possible, right? So, so yeah, so the classes are all the, the values of these parameters. So, um, yeah, so there are many, theoretically many classes. Practically, we see that uh, the real systems fall into certain classes that are probably more important or some, somehow more useful than the others because certain types of correlations in the multiplicity space are more uh, common in the systems. But theoretically, yes, th then you have the whole set of these numbers and it can be anything that is allowed by the current engine axioms. Uh, all these uh, satisfy the four axioms? So they satisfy the three axioms three. and then the fourth is are replaced by the speaker version that you say it scales with these exponents. It's a bit uh, similar to the situation in geometry when a century ago when, when they removed the fourth axiom, uh, Euclidean axiom, mm -hmm. and they, they reached this uh, classification with three yes. geometry. Uh, kind of, it's, yeah, it's kind of similar, exactly. To have uh, uh, big classes of information theory, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that, exactly. Um, yes, so then the particular functions just um, influence how the system behaves for finite scales. In infinite, you, you basically have these universality classes. So it's really like in the theory of critical phenomena that you have these universality classes that only are determined by the exponents. Um, okay. Now I want to talk a bit about another approach that is from the from the statistical inference that um so since James was uh, proposing all these uh, approach this information theoretic approaches and statistical approaches to entropy then sometimes later people are thinking okay so let's consider the maximum entropy principle as um as basically the inference principle. Uh, but if you have any inference principle in statistics, there should be some consistency requirements. So for example, uh, and this was done by Shore and Johnson in the 80s, that they said that if I have the maximum entropy principle, so basically I take my constraints that are maybe by the data or my model uh, and my entropy, I maximize the entropy such that the constraints are fulfilled. So again, this method of, of Lagrange multipliers, then of course, what we require that the uh, result should be unique. Then permutation invariance, it is something that uh, is uh, like the symmetry of, uh, of uh, entropy that, that the permutation of states should not matter. So basically if you label the state, so if you label them one, two, three, four, five, it doesn't matter if I label them five, one, three, two, one. 
Uh, so this is natural. So then there is subset independence. So it should not matter whether one treats the joint subsets of a system states in separate conditional distribution or in terms of full distribution. So this means that we have a full system and we have some uh, constraint on a subsystem. So then it should not matter whether you take the conditional distribution on the subsystem or the full distribution. You sh it should give you the same result. Uh, and then there is the fourth that is most controversial. So it should not matter whether one accounts for independent constraint related to disjoint subsystems separately in terms of marginal distributions or in terms of full system constraints and joint distribution. So consider that you have two disjoint systems. You have the uh, you have the constants of both of them. So they say it should not matter whether I basically do the maximum entropy principle for each of the subsystems separately, or if I do it for the joint distribution. And then maximality. So in absence of any prior information, uniform distribution should be the solution. Again, this is what we were considering in Shanghai. Is it possible to have independent constraints over the systems called? Of course, of course. So independent independent constraints means constraints about disjoint systems. So if you have a system and another system, and basically they, they don't share any states. So whenever they are really physically separated, so let's say like I have like two boxes, uh, constraint on one box, constraint on the other box. These are independent constraints. But then the two boxes are not correlated. Uh, there might be, of course, the, the question about the system because I'm just... so so you know so we have an energy of one system, energy of the other system, and then this is the question whether the total energy is some of these energies or not. Mainly it is, but there might maybe some interaction energy between these two systems, right? Yeah, I'm somewhat confused. I also thought of these two boxes, and then some seems kind of trivial to me. But if there are correlation. That seems like a very strong assumption, a very strong assumption. Exactly. The, the, you, are, you, are quite, you are having it very correct because I will show you that this is exactly the controversy about this, uh, this axiom because what you have is mainly if, if you have a, like a box of gas, for example, then it's natural that we have energy of the one box, energy of the other box, and then the total energy is some of these energies, right? Because it's just gases, but there might be other systems. You can think about, I don't know, quantum entanglement where you have two particles. And, and of course, if you are talking about entanglement, then basically they are correlated. Or if you have some other systems like gravitational systems, then of course they are correlated. So if you take the energy of, I don't know, one part of a system that is gravitating and the other part, so like one black hole, second black hole, then we know that the total energy is not the sum of these energies that have the energy. So, so then the energy in black holes plays the role of the uh, size of the black hole, right? So, or, or the area. Uh, so then we know that the sum that the, the area of the black hole when two are merged, it's not the sum of the areas, right? So uh, so then in these cases, uh, it's a bit too strict, uh, as you correctly pointed out. Uh, and uh, what I want to mention is that there's been really some controversy about this. Uh, and it's quite a funny because also it led to um, one of my um, first papers. So um, basically this was done in um, a work by uh, two statisticians, Shore and Johnson, where they defined these consistency requirements. They also derived that only Shannon entropy is the correct one. And this is something that they really wanted to show because at that time in information theory, there were some other measures that were sometimes called entropies that might start to be relevant. Um, a guy, uh, Jos Ufink, and then 15 years later uh, was carefully going through the proof and he showed that they uh, basically in their proof used one assumption that is exactly what you mentioned, that if the two systems are disjoint, they must be independent, which is not included in the original sets of axioms, but they use in the proof. So they basically are restraining themselves by 
but much smaller class of entropies. And he showed that basically the, the these axioms as they originally um, formulate, as they were originally formulated, uh, is fulfilled by a large class of entropies, including any studies, et cetera. Basically any function of any entropy, any increasing function of any entropy satisfies these axioms. And then in 2013, um, um, the group by Steve Presser that I mentioned earlier in the previous talk came in and wrote a paper that non-additive entropies, because there was a boom of this size entropy, particularly uh, yield probability distributions with biases, because they are not warranted by the data. They basically say by this that they don't satisfy Sharon Kinchin axioms, and they repeat the, the proof of uh, Sharon Johnson. And then Constantino Tsalis uh, saw this paper, got angry, of course, because they were ruining his entropy and wrote a paper that maybe then the, these short Johnson axioms are not adequate. Uh, and then Steve Presser replied to them that they are adequate and then, sorry, your entropy is not uh, useful in any way. And then there were other scientists that, that tried to do the same thing with the entropy, with the Rennie entropy and, uh, then uh, me and my former supervisor, Peter Jisba, tried to hopefully resolve this issue once forever, where in this paper in physical letters, we tried to really discuss uh, the solution and also show the systems like entangled systems or uh, quantum systems uh, or gravitational systems. We also discuss uh, high energy collisions where basically you have um, like, Particle, where you say one particle is my system and the rest of the particles is the bath. But then the bath is not much larger than the system because it's only a few particles, so typically like 20. And then you have this fine size effects that basically the system of my interest and the bath, which is the rest of the particles get correlated. So then you see very often, uh, if you look at the papers from CERN, that they observe the, 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 the Charles distribution with Q going very close to one, so it's something like 1.5, 1.05. Uh, 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 I think, no, this, this is really, um, we've discussed this uh, with a few people. They think it's really just the statistics that we have this small bar. Uh, because it's um, universal for different types of particles. Uh, so, so it's not only one type of particles, but also the exponent is pretty universal and it's something like 1.05. And you can calculate by easy calculations so that, that basically the Q is something like uh, one plus one over N or something like that uh, in like very vague. So if it's N is 20, so then it's like one plus one over 20 and then it, it really vaguely corresponds. So it's probably is fine size effect. But there are, pe there are people that still try to dispute this um yeah so it's never never ending show uh and what we were then trying to show in our next paper is that uh the shannon kinchin axioms and the uh, short johnson axioms uh basically define the same class of entropy so if we say that uh what is the class of entropies that satisfies the shannon kinchin axioms and the uh generalized um uh, the generalized Sharon Kinchin axioms, either in form of uh, what Bellimer was doing or uh, Pierre Giulio was doing, and the short Johnson axioms, then we see that this, uh, this, this function, this is basically the function of Rennie entropy, and a function of Rennie entropy, increasing function of Rennie entropy, fulfills both of them. So basically, from this perspective, they are equivalent, and uh, Shannon and Kinchin did some what they did in information theory and short Johnson. In, uh, in statistical inference is equivalent. So now they can shake their hands. Although maybe Shannon and Kinchin cannot do it anymore. Uh, good, so um, then I uh, want to talk about one more thing that might not be, might be a bit surprising to you because in your course on stochastic thermodynamics, what you were doing is that you basically took Shannon entropy uh, and took the assumption so that uh, that there is a detailed balance and that there is linear Markov evolution. And then you show that the second law of thermodynamic balance. 
Now you can reverse this by saying, let's say that I have the second law of thermodynamics, I have detailed bonds, and I have the numerical of evolution. And my question is whether the Shannon entropy is the only entropy that fulfills these, uh, these three conditions. Uh, um, because it's not a priori clear. So we show the other way around. It doesn't mean that, that this, this, this must also hold. And what you can show is that actually by these three conditions, you again up to uh, maybe multiplicative constant, the Shannon entropy is the unique entropy that satisfies these three, if you want to call it axioms, so these three axioms. And this is a special case of more general result that connect the nonlinear mass equation and generalized entropy. So then what we were considering is that we said that the in this mass equation, we have not P, but the function of P, and then this function of P can be related to the function of generalized entropy. So then what we were um, discovering is that if you have nonlinear dynamics, then it's naturally related to generalized entropies. What is Q? Q is uh, heat. Okay, heat is defined, uh, sorry, there should be Q oh. dot. So normally, so, so it's like in stochastic thermodynamics, you have the internal energy sum of Pi epsilon i. So the heat is the sum of Pi dot epsilon i and the work is sum of Pi epsilon dot i. This is good just for a lot of... Thermodynamics, yes, this is the thermodynamic one. Just for a lot Yes. So yeah, so, so then, then it's like linear thermodynamics with detail balance. But we, we were just, we were interested in this connection and uh, also the question whether it's the only entropy that, that can be used because it's- Excuse me, uh, yeah. so now you can change, okay, you can change the, the third axiom, which is second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. but you can change the first and the second one. Mm -hmm. in terms, you cannot generalize the third axiom. Right? The third axiom, which yeah. which third axiom? Uh, second law of thermodynamics. Ah, okay. Does it make sense to, to consider ah, okay. pseudo addition there, for example? Uh, not we, uh, well, depends. So if we say that this SE, the entropy flow, is the, is the change of entropy of the infinite reservoir that's always in equilibrium, then it doesn't make any sense. Then you would need to consider another system of that. Basically here we say that since the, end, since the heat bath is infinite, then it's independent from the system of interest and then these two entropies must to be additive. If you, if you have some other system, then maybe yes, but then it's very hard to make the constraining over the fine bath because you cannot use the, the, the these simplifications that you use for in, infinite half Okay, so the third uh, uh, axiom is fixed, and what about the first and the second? Uh, so, so yeah, the, 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 fir the first, yes, so that's what we did. So you can consider nonlinear Markov dynamics. What we plan to do is to consider maybe non Markovian dynamics. Um, for the second one, you can also try to generalize this, but always the, because this you needed to get the thermodynamic interpretation because this this uh, the stationary or equilibrium distribution gives you the relation between thermodynamics and dynamics. And if you go with this standard uh, way, for example, to detail balance to uh, add power to alpha, for example. You can, you can do that. And if, if, if you don't get, what, what are we going to get? I, 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 I don't know what you get. Um, the thing is that here, the reason why, why we choose it is because, um, so, so if, if you do the, the following thing that you say, I want to, I change it to the nonlinear dynamics, then basically the detail balance, balance looks like WMN function of this P. So basically you always say that in this bracket, in this round bracket is uh, the so-called probability flow and we say that the probability flow vanishes because this is what defines equilibrium. In equilibrium, um, all flows vanish. So it's not about the, the fact that it's time independent because this is not enough. This might be an equilibrium steady state, but also about the fact that all currents vanish. This is what defines equilibrium. Actually, I said it wrong. So it should be generalized like, uh, 
I mean, you can play with that, uh, but here uh, the, it's this natural reason that that you have this probability flow. So then, if you generalize the the linear evolution and you write it as sum of probability flows, then you basically say, I want to have the probability flow uh, vanish for the equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some question for so the SI. Yes. The only constraint is the positivity and the fact that it vanishes at the cable. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, is the rule that uh, for not to give you thermodynamics, uh, the equations are not linear? You can find such systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but can be linear. Uh, yeah, so equation, equation. So normally it's it's the master equation is linear, but we found a few examples. They are not like purely physical tip or like there are some, especially uh, more for the case of continuous dynamics for focal point equations, uh, then you can have then in coarse media, in um, fractal uh, Dynamics. This is more typical for, let's say, evol evolutionary systems or financial systems to have this nonlinear Markov equation. But you can find examples. They are not super uh, ubiquitous, but you can find those examples. And uh, that's it. So we did it to the end. And then I would like to hear your um, comments, opinions. What do you think? What you've learned? Anything you want to say? And then you can also drink in the meanwhile. <laughs> so, cheers and thank you for being here. Cheers. cheers. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I, maybe I didn't get some major points, but I. No, oh, yeah. I, I don't understand what, what makes you. Uh, it, I mean, if you have some phenomenology that makes you, um, yeah, think about these postulates of the entropy, or I mean, if I have a system in a very practical way, yes, like what, yeah, what information will make me? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's a very good question, and it is also our problem. And I started um, being interested in this entropy that many people were generalizing these axioms and we're getting different entropy functionals, I don't see any application. So that's why um, I really like the approach in the second uh, lecture that basically you take your system that is maybe more complicated than, than, than the regular gas or like um, uh, some, 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 some throwing of coins and then you calculate it basically and you get the answer and then you, then you are interested in that system. Some people do it because of the mathematical beauty, so to say. Some people do it because, you know, they are interested in general phenomena. Um, but yeah, it's a like, question that I also had many times. <laughs> Thank you. Can we come back to the last slide? If you can put it, yeah. I have some problem for uh, believing this story. <coughs> because uh, I learned to tell me that S key is fixed, okay, it's of thermal isothermal system. Uh -huh. So you use closures, okay, this is I also. But S E, uh, so sorry, S I S I is totally free. Mm -hmm. Just there is one constraint that it's zero at equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And that is fixed totally as yeah. But you have to remember that you are uh, you are uh, have the linear Markov evolution. So when you take that the SI is the function of probability, then the time derivative of probability appears, which gives which puts you in this this form. And then basically you like it seems like the, the detail balance seems okay. like a small constraint, but it's actually a big constraint because you, it really tells you it must be zero only at this point, and in all other points it must be positive. And this is kind of, you can then show that, that this is kind of the constraint that, that gives you this solution. Yeah, so I know it seems that this is like subtle, but 
also remember that this means that this, this holds for all pairs of M and N, N and M. So this is actually quite strong then. So I know it seems that it's it's just you know almost no no constraints, which is I think nice about this that that very natural constraints, nothing special, give you this Shannon entropy. Yeah, you can you can you can have a look to the paper. There is also the proof. Yeah, I will. So mm -hmm. maybe I will have uh, one suggestion mm -hmm. for closing the talk. Because we have a lot of papers here, a lot, a lot of words written, maybe we can read it short, quickly to see where we started, where we came. Yes, if you can do that, because I'm a little bit... Yes, we do, but... <coughs> no, after. Okay, so uh, from what I understood, you... He was putting these sticks... Uh, like uh, if they yeah, come, yeah, yeah, I, so I they tried to try to order them as, as uh, according to the days. It might not be hundred uh, percent okay. True so now. I will just uh, read the names and uh, I will read responses. And uh, this is actually from the first day to the last day by Jan. Uh, theoretical bias physics. Uh, he said about entropy, a measure of disorder that uh, can only increase. Sandeep uh, uh, from machine learning also uh, is written here. Moment mentioned about entropy in quantum physics and the variable which tell us about what is the direction of process. Dana uh, said uh, about uh, entropy as disorder. Then uh, we have uh, uh, Tiana that put this nice formula delta S equals delta Q over T. Then uh, uh, we have uh, Jans. Is it Jans? Hold on. Measure of the solder that uh, can only increase for so the second time. Uh, Martin said the measure of uh, no maintenance of the system. Alexandre. Uh, is uh, no of atoms number of atoms of information. Uh, then Javier uh, said this famous bomb Postman formula. Uh, we have uh, also a lack of knowledge. Interesting answer by Jose. Petze mentioned this as a measure of chaos of the system. Uh, Nico Neshic said uh, about it as a measure of. Uh, disorder of the system. So we have a lot of uh, answers about measure of disorder. Uh, also, uh, delta S equals delta Q over T is very, very often mentioned also by Elena, Milkitsa, uh, again, Ivana, lack of order. Uh, then uh, we had uh, mentioned uh, a lot of applications about information theory, then in time series analysis, uh, then uh, like in uh, intrusion properties or uh, appearance of entropy, we had the uh, black hole thermodynamics, uh, uh, we had uh, also mentioned entropy in cybernetics. Uh, uh, I'm uh, just going quickly because the, it was a lot of uh, answer, also connection with arrow of time in irreversibility, connection with second law of thermodynamic uh, dynamics, uh, again, entropy as arrow of time, and uh, also several uh, possible uh, applications, time series, analysis, biological systems, and so on. I think that. Uh, Jan actually supported all of these answers with uh, his talk, and uh, he actually gave us a uh, very good uh, retrospective of uh, entropy from all possible views. So, thank you very much, Jan, for thank giving you. us these great uh, lectures. So, uh, with this, we are uh, closing today uh, lectures. I would also like uh, to make one uh, announcement for in-person students. 
but also a very important announcement uh, for all of, all of the participants. So soon you will receive the questionnaire about the school, and we would greatly appreciate uh, if you can uh, fill in the questionnaire as soon as possible. Ideally, tomorrow during the day, please find some five minutes to make it uh, while memories are still uh, fresh. And uh, yes, with this, I think that we can close the lectures. Thank you all for Zoom.